thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Jeff. We're here to talk about walking, which is one of your favorite topics. So we are strolling the MPT corridors on our way to the studio. Why are you such a big fan of walking? So I'm very passionate about the different behaviors that all of us can participate in that can reduce our risk of chronic disease and improve our overall well-being. Physical activity is one of those things, and walking is so accessible to everybody. And I really think it's the ideal exercise. It's the official exercise of the state of Maryland. It is. But there are some people who would look at it and say, if you're not breaking a sweat, this is really exercise. So we know that there are different levels of activity. Um, activity can be classified as mild, moderate, or vigorous. And you can actually adjust your walking routine. Please have a seat. To fit any of those activity levels. So yes, you can take a really low pace, leisurely stroll, but you can also adjust the intensity of your walking by walking faster or by walking on different surfaces, walking on unpaved surfaces, you know, and, and other ways as well that you can kind of up the intensity level. It seems like such a basic human activity. I mean, I, I've been doing it since I was a toddler, right? <laughs> How can it actually be good for you? And, and I mean, should we bother with a, a, a low intensity walk or, or are you saying that we really need to step it up a little bit? So I think it's important to have a mix of different types of intensity levels for your activity. Um, and really, all activity is beneficial. The more we move our body, the more helpful it is um, and the more benefits we see for health. Uh, the CDC publishes their physical activity guidelines for Americans, and they recommend a minimum of 150 minutes of moderate physical activity a week. Uh, and you could get that in by walking for 30 minutes, five days a week. How about uh, the difference between walking uh, indoors in our vast corridors or at the mall or something and, and outdoors where you may have more changes in elevation? So walking in different locations will give you different kinds of, uh, different kinds of a workout. Walking indoors is definitely beneficial. You know, if the weather is really terrible and you're not gonna get outside and walk, walking indoors in the mall or on a treadmill, you're getting your steps in. But we know that when you take your walk outside, you, the, the surface is more uneven. So you will be challenging your body a little bit more by doing that. You're also gonna have elevation changes. So you'll have inclines and declines. Um, that also will, you know, kind of cause you to have to work a little bit harder at certain times. So you will ramp up your um, actual activity level when you take your walk outside. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about your walking uh, exercise habits, um, send us an email, livequestions at mpt.org. Let's focus in a little bit on the, the mental health as aspects of this. I mean, I, I've been known to take a walk to clear my head. Mm -hmm. Everybody does that, right? And, and it's somewhat effective. Walking has tremendous benefits for not just our physical health, but our mental health as well. We know that walking decreases, it decreases stress and anxiety. It decreases the risk of developing depression. And it also decreases the risk of Alzheimer's and other age-related dementias. Walking will help to improve your sleep, uh, improve your mood, and improve your energy levels. So there are multiple mental health benefits. Stuff we can do to make it a little bit more challenging in terms of uh, going faster, finding some hills, and, and I see different kinds of weights that, that people can wear. It's like a thing that goes around your, your wrist. You see people sometimes carrying weights, mm -hmm. all helpful. If you are looking to amp up the actual workout of the walk, then there are different things you can do. I do caution people who have uh, issues with balance and mobility. You really wanna be careful when you're starting out. Walking is a very safe activity for people at all physical fitness levels. But if you have difficulty with balance, you do want to try to choose a surface that is smooth and level so that you decrease your risk of falling. 
as you are more mobile, then you can start taking your walk um, on other surfaces. So you can uh, go outdoors. There are even on a paved surface outside, it's still gonna be slightly uneven. Um, you're still gonna have some elevation changes. So that is kind of the next level. Then you can go to unpaved surfaces. That will definitely you know, increase your need to pay attention to balance as you're also walking. Um, if you want to kind of make it a little bit more of a strength type of exercise, you can start getting weights involved. They do make um, ankle and wrist weights. I think that you do need to be careful. Again, if you have some issues with mobility, flexibility, or balance, they can you know, kind of throw you off a little bit. Um, but if you don't have issues with those, you can use those. You can also use a weighted vest, which I actually really like because it helps keeping the weight over your center of gravity. Um, and so it, it doesn't kind of throw your balance off as much as weights on your extremities. And I actually read that um, even without uh, additional weights, that walking counts as uh, weight-bearing exercise for bone density purposes for people concerned about that. Walking does count as, uh, as a weight-bearing exercise because you are supporting your body weight while you're walking. So these muscles of your lower extremities um, are working to keep your body weight upright and moving. Where did the, the 10,000 steps a day thing come from? Was that like, you know, phone manufacturers just made it up? <laughs> is, is there any science behind that? Yes and no. So 10,000 steps, that specific number, is a little bit arbitrary. It actually was developed it's a, like a Japanese marketing scheme. Um, and so that number itself isn't based in science. But since that number has kind of become popularized as a goal for walking. You don't mind that? that I, I certainly don't mind it. Because let me tell you, even though we have recommendations for minimum amounts of activity, that is not a limit. This is a situation where more is always better. So the more active you are, the more benefits you'll see. And the research that has been done looking at steps, step counting, um, really we recommend that people try to aim for a goal of somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,000 to 7,000 steps. If you're starting from basically being very inactive, any steps you take are gonna be beneficial. What if anything should happen to your heart rate uh, for, for a beginning walker? Should it go up a little bit? It should go up. That is the way that we gauge whether an activity is mild, moderate, or vigorous. And you can have a heart rate monitor, and it's based on your age to calculate what your target heart rate should be for these different kinds of activities. But there's kind of a, a quick and easy way that people can use to determine what their level of activity is. It's called the talk test. So if you're walking, and you're having a conversation with somebody, and you can easily talk without getting out of breath. And just say you were motivated to start singing. You could sing and not get out of breath. That would be mild physical activity. Now, if you're walking a little bit faster, a little bit more vigorously, you can still carry on a conversation with another person without getting winded. But if you were to try to sing, you would get out of breath. That's moderate physical activity. And then vigorous activity is where even carrying on a regular conversation like we are now would cause you to become short of breath. Um, viewer wants to know, do you actually burn more calories when walking in colder weather? Now, yeah. if I'm walking in colder weather, I have a coat on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but your body does have to generate some heat. Your body does generate heat, and when you're breathing cold air, your body has to work to warm that air as it enters you know, through your, uh, your respiratory passages and into your lungs. So there is a little bit of increased metabolism that happens when you're walking in cold weather. How about burning calories? I was told or read long ago, inaccurately, that um, walking a mile uh, consume the same amount of calories as running a mile. It's not true. Everything I, everything I read now is it's maybe half. And if you get up to a really fast walk, then, then it can be sort of close. You know, 
I think that there's so many variables that come into determining how many calories are burned with a specific activity. Part of it is what your base level of fitness is. Somebody who is more physically fit is going to have to work less to do the same level of exercise as somebody who maybe is not quite as physically fit. So there is some variability there. Um, I think not so much focusing on calories, but we really want to look at the amount of time that we spend moving our body and being active. A uh, viewer wants to know what kind of walking should you do if you've had a hip replacement, which maybe should go to your physical therapist, but, but general thoughts on that. Yes, yeah, so it is important when you have any kind of chronic medical condition and you're getting ready to start a physical activity routine, you want to discuss this with your physician. Um, after a hip replacement, physical activity, I'm sorry, um, physical therapy is incredibly important. You can discuss with your physical therapist and your physician when is a good point to start incorporating walking, but we really do want people after knee or hip replacements to be up and walking and moving as quickly as possible, and it's such a low impact exercise. It can be really beneficial. Tell me about walk with a doc. There's two chapters in Harford County. You run one of them? So, yeah, yes. So, Walk with a Doc is a national nonprofit organization, and uh, they have chapters all over the U.S. and around the world. Um, it's such a great organization. They are working to try to get uh, patients and healthcare providers out in the community together to promote physical activity and health literacy. And we have two chapters in Harford County that are sponsored by University of Maryland Upper Chesapeake Health. I lead the chapter that is in Bel Air that's held at Shucks Park, and I co-lead, along with Dr. Phil Halstead, the chapter that is in Joppa Town at Magnolia Elementary School. You have two specialties. One of them is pediatrics. Mm -hmm. The other one is uh, somewhat newer. It's something called lifestyle medicine. You're board certified. How did you uh, discover this field? I came to lifestyle medicine really through my own health journey uh, because they don't teach you how to be healthy in medical school. They teach you how to treat care of sick people. disease and treat right. symptoms, yes. Uh, but you don't learn how to be healthy. And after years of kind of, you know, these long hours working, studying, eating whenever I could, carrying snacks in my pockets because you don't always have time to sit down and have a meal. Yeah. Um, I was overweight and tired and I couldn't even walk up a flight of stairs. So I was really investigating things I could do to improve my health. And that led me to learn about lifestyle medicine. And now I just want to spread the information to everybody. And walking is a part of that walking in just is, a sentence. Walking is one of the six pillars. The others are uh, a plant predominant diet, um, mindfulness, sleep, um, substance abuse avoidance, and social connection. All good advice. Marie Kanegi McLeese of Upper Chesapeake Health, part of the University of Maryland Medical System. We thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.